Well, the kids got me to blow a little bit of surprise here. I, I really, for the first time ever, I know I say this a lot, but that's scripture for me. I, I just, there's always something new. And uh, in Mark chapter 2, it says uh, that the people, he was in Capernaum, and people heard that he was at home. And people heard that he was at home. So they gathered, right? And so, like his home? Or Capernaum is his home? So we can, we can gather two things from this. I'm going to assume two things, so just for our spiritual interest. First, that Capernaum was Jesus' home base. And that that's well known. And so, you know, Jesus of Nazareth, born in Bethlehem, but hung out in Capernaum, up at the top of uh, the Sea of Galilee. Capernaum, I think, is where Peter and uh, Andrew are from as well. And that's where they had their base. So Jesus was at home, maybe like he was in his home, like where he hung out. But it just says he was in his home and immediately goes to this roof-tearing business and the lowering of the man. So I'm like, it's Jesus' house. I never have ever, ever thought of Jesus having a house. How about you? What did it look like? Did he have art in the walls? Did he do his own cooking? Did his mom live with him? It's Jesus' house, folks. You look like you've thought about this for decades. Never once did I ever think about Jesus having a house. You know, the Son of Man has no place to lay his head, right? I mean, like we always thought, he's just homeless. He's at his house. He, when they heard he was at home, they went and visited him, right? You've all been there where you've tried to sneak back into town. Have you ever done that after vacation? It's like, look, we're cutting the, we're cutting the camping short by a few days, but let's just slip into town and not be seen. Let's not tell anybody. And we're not going to answer the phone or check our messages. You've all tried that. Jesus, very hard to slip anywhere, right? And so they heard he was at home. Company comes. It's so stuffed that these friends, and it's such, I mean, we could just go on for years about this one scene. And i got to say, Mark chapter 2, the piece we are given was overwhelming. I mean, it's got eight sermon stories in there alone. But this one of the, the paralytic man, the paralyzed man being dropped down through the roof always captured my imagination as a kid. And I just, like, as a, you know, how did they get that roof apart, right? How did they, it, as I said immediately, how did they get them up there? Like, you just start to think about the dedication. Now, some of it, some of it, as I was talking to Chelsea, does sound like a harebrained idea by a bunch of buddies. You know, those, those buddies, the friends who are always good to get into a little bit of trouble, right? I had a friend, what, Ian, and whenever we got in a cab after a night out of uh, soda pop and movies, we'd get in a cab, and, and, if, and there was one cab company in Halifax called Casino Taxi, and they had a really great jingle that I can still sing to you off by heart today, but I'm not going to. But we'd get into like a United cab line or something, and we'd sing the Casino Taxi theme in the back of other cabs. You know, those kind of friends. <laughs> Rabble rousers. So you can imagine this scene, and this guy is outcast, and he doesn't have many friends. But the few he's got from his childhood, who still have stuck it out with him, even though he's an outcast, are like, well, we see the desperation in your eyes, and we've heard the good things about this man. This man who, when he sees people in trouble, he sees outcasts, has the gut-wrenching compassion for them. We've heard about him, and we know that you've struggled. We'll make it happen. Well, how are you going to make it happen? There's all these people in the way. Just trust us. Just trust us. That's what those buddies always say. Just trust us. And they rig up this contraption onto his mat, and they haul him up on the roof. And imagine the people inside there. They're all very pious listening to Jesus. You know, everybody's like, shh, 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 listen to what he says. Blessed are the meek, or whatever it is he's saying, right? Listen, it's a hushed crowd. And there's scribes there too, so everybody's behaving themselves. And all of a sudden, the roof gets torn off, right? It's a great scene about the kingdom bursting through. It's a great scene about the light of God not worrying about, you know, protocols and who's in and who's out. It's a beautiful scene of God's healing love. Jesus says, not get up and walk. Your legs are healed. That's not the first thing he says. What does he say? Your sins are forgiven. And that gets right to the point of Mark. And it gets right to the point of Jesus. It's not the physical healing. It's what it says to the world, which is 
this man has done nothing wrong. His parents did nothing wrong. His grandparents did nothing wrong. He is forgiven. And then they challenge him on it. It's that same old authority part. Who is this guy? The scribes say. Who is he that he can forgive people? Only God forgives people. That's what they say to themselves. And it's one of those great gospel things where Jesus perceives what they're thinking. You know, like with his ESP. He knows what they're thinking. He says, just in case you're thinking what I know you're thinking. It's easy to forgive people. Harder to say, get up and walk. But guess what? I'm going to do both. And the man spins around on his little brad, spins, and gets up, takes his mat, out he goes, declaring the love of God. I just imagine the ripples in the pool that happens with that one man. I just imagine how many outcasts he spoke to and offered forgiveness to. I imagine how he was or maybe not you know, invited back into his family and into community, but could not shut up about the love of God from that day on to the day of his death. Imagine. Imagine. I also imagine like the rest of us, he got his working, his legs working again, but probably complained about his back the rest of his life. Oh, my back. Stop it. Jesus healed you. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> God loves you. And he just tells everybody, just can't keep it in. He's got to let it out, like Cat Stevens, right? Can't. Just the love of God spreading it everywhere, everywhere it goes. I wanted to pause and tell you about my mentor, Bill Hendry. It's been a long, a lot of years since I've talked to you about him. Bill was the minister at Sydenham Street United Church in uh, Kingston, Ontario, when I was a student at Queen's University. And one day, uh, during a, a gathering at Queen's Theological College, uh, lots of strangers, lots of old ministers, old alumni hanging around, this kind of stuff. I had been in a circle conversation with people, and we were on a break, and I was stretching in the hallway. And uh, this guy comes along, and he pokes me in the stomach. And he says, I like you. I like you a lot. You should come be my student next year. Ask, ask Jean about it. She's the professor who ran student placements. And then he just chuckled and walked away. It was Bill Hendry. Bill Hendry. There's no person that has affected my ministry more than Bill Hendry. Not a week goes by that I, that I don't use a skill, a philosophy, a theology, a belief system, a pastoral ability that Bill Hendry didn't start teaching me. Not a week goes by in ministry that I don't, I'm not informed by what that mentor taught me. Well, I didn't know what was to come. And the second year, I, of course, said to the, to the professor, could I, could I study with, you know, could I go be a student minister at Sydenham Street United where Bill Andrew is? And she chuckled like there's a trouble a coming and said, sure. And the rest of that year, Jean Stairs would say I was in her office every third or fourth week in tears because of stuff that Bill told me or said or the way he poked my spirit and shook me loose. We talked about a lot of stuff. Bill always got right to the point. He was so authentic. Still is. One time in the middle of that year, we finished a very tough session with each other. It was kind of part supervision, part counseling, part psychotherapy. And uh, Bill says, you know, we've just done it. It's about 4.35 o'clock in the afternoon. He says, come on and jump on the truck. This is just how he was. Come on and jump on the truck. We'll get some pizza. We'll go up to the house and see Lorna and have dinner together. So I go, okay, Bill. And we get in the truck. But as we're driving toward the pizza buying joint, I said to him, now, Bill, I want to talk about boundaries because you're my mentor and my teacher and my supervisor. I'm not, I'm not sure. You're like, is it okay that I come to your house? I'm not sure if that's good boundaries or not. You know, like you're, you're not, you're more than my minister. You're a supervisor, mentor, and I'm a student. And oh, that's just who we, he says. How are you supposed to know what ministers live like as you study to be a minister if you don't come see it? Come on and see. Lauren will be happy. Lauren will be so delighted to have you for pizza. Just like that, he just blustered through all of the rules of the world, constantly. He'd swing his hand and his Scottish accent would come out from his childhood. And he'd say, who taught you that? Who taught you that? 
I'm going to call them because that's just wrong. I'm like, there's boundaries. No, there's not. Yes, there is. You know, you're the supervisor. I'm the student. You're in it. Come on. We're having pizza with Lorna. And there began a friendship and a mentorship that broke me open and changed my life forever. Bill Hendry is one of the greatest visions for me of God's grace in my life. Have you ever had anybody come to your house who was held in such esteem in your heart that you were terrified and worried and almost paralyzed about how to host them and what to do and whether you were going to be enough and whether the house looked okay? Not just your general company stuff, like I got to clean up the laundry and stuff, but like, like somebody who is so important that you are just jittery and nervous and know probably in your heart you're going to fail in your hospitality. You ever had one of those times? Well, in some moment of insanity, I asked Bill Hendry to come visit me in my dorm room in grad school at Queens, above the Student Union building. I told him, I've been to his house for pizza. Well, like, Bill, would you like to come for tea some evening? You know, maybe after choir or something? It seemed loving at the moment. I was terrified. Because Bill, at that point, was his immense presence. You know, he's like, he's like the Dalai Lama of my life, right? And I'm, I got this tiny little grad dorm room that if I laid it on my bed, I could touch my head to one wall and my feet to the other wall, okay? And it had room for a desk, a chair, and a bed. And here's the weird thing. I sat in the office, in the desk chair, and I could still see to this day Bill Hendry, and he was a big man, sitting on my bed with his feet out like this and me fussing about pillows and stuff and what kind of tea he wants and all this kind of stuff. And of course, he chuckled a lot. That deep, holy chuckle that he had that just sometimes made me feel loved and sometimes made me feel a little worried. And it just was the strangest. You ever had somebody in your house you just think, this is very strange that they are sitting in my living room. Well, Bill was sitting on my bed, a single, just a little tiny single bed. And it had me all a jitter. It was a beautiful thing. Grace won the day, of course, as it always did with Bill. Grace and love won the day. Although when I shut the door, I thought, I am never doing that again. It seemed very odd to have an adult from the real world walk through the halls of graduate residence because we were all still pretending we lived in the real world, but we were students, and you know that's not true. Right? Remember you? Remember going to school? Some of you have been to college, university? It's like a dream world. And here's this guy from the real world coming down the hall, and we're talking, and people are looking, oh, you know, who's this guy? And there he is in my room, and it just didn't ever seem enough. But love, his love, God's love won the day. So that's what I was interested in this scripture lesson. Jesus went to Levi's house. He met Levi, who we, we now know is Matthew. Uh, the tax collector, Levi. And he meets him, and he says, come and follow me. And not, you know, they hardly hit the road when he says, they, you know, they end up at Levi's house. I don't know who invited who, but they end up at Levi's house immediately. I love the fact that he says, come and follow me. And the next step is to visit him in his home and have a meal. What rebellion. The simple act of eating with the hated and the damned was as powerful as the healing of the man whose legs hadn't worked. It was as much creation of turmoil, flipping the scribes and Pharisees' understanding of God on their heels. They just complained. How is it now he eats with sinners and tax collectors? Tax collectors being Jewish people who worked for the Romans. Sellouts. The worst of the worst. People would spit at Levi as they went by because he was doing the empire's work. And Jesus just goes to his house. That's what, that's what God does. God comes right to where we are. God rushes in and says, let's have a meal together. We get nervous when the light comes rushing in. We get a little jittery when we're close to grace. It's epiphany. We celebrate the light. 
We celebrate the light of God coming close to us, seeking us out, getting near to us, piercing our lives, hurting our eyes and our hearts. It can make us bashful, it can make us uncertain, and it can make us jittery and anxious. And too often, we resist. I love that Linnea Good hymn we sung at the beginning. When light comes pouring into the darkest place, it hurts our eyes to see its glow. Because sometimes the word of hope reminds us of our own fears, our memories and our tears. It can be unsettling when the light arrives right in the midst of our own ordinary lives. It hurts. It scares us. It makes us nervous when the light comes pouring in. I try and think of stuff that's in my heart so clearly. How can I tell you about it? When was the last time you saw the sunrise? Anybody just tell me the last time you saw the sunrise. What, this morning? Did you see it? Came right in my office window? It's pretty easy in the winter. It's pretty easy in the winter, you notice. Well, some of us are bumbling around, we don't notice. Just take a moment, close your eyes if you need to. Remember the last time you saw the sunrise in a wonderful way? When you really noticed. Can you think about the window that you saw it through? Was it a car? Was it a kitchen? Were you outdoors? At the cabin? By a lake? On your front lawn, your back lawn, just that one side of your house where the sun rises in the east? Can you remember what that sunrise felt like when you actually stopped and took notice? Maybe if you're in a car, it hurt your eyes because you're driving in that direction. Maybe if you're in a cold kitchen, you couldn't believe its warmth and beauty. Do you remember the sunrises that have touched your life? Because God has a lot of them for your heart as well. It's epiphany. God's light is showing up in all the unexpected places of our heart. And we are invited and welcome. We are asked and called to welcome and invite and to give thanks. May it be so.